big wins in the AI era are not going to come from people who just replace 2023 talent with AIs. It's going to come from people who are using AI to deliver, you know, services and products um, and to work in ways that we can't even foresee yet. If you are trying to energize and motivate your organization, if you're trying to drive innovation in your organization, you need your employees to actually buy in and care about what you're doing. And coercion does not make that happen. So your whole thing for a long time has been proselytizing about technology, helping people be more productive, more efficient. Uh, and then obviously you co-wrote a book called Remote Work, which is very prescient because uh, you know something happened where we had to, to work remotely, then work hybridly. Um, but it's now 2023 uh, and you read a great, uh, you wrote a great article um, the other month about how a good way to frame our thinking about hybrid work is it's like a four-year degree you get at university. Yes. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It, no. it's, it's a journey. So we're two and a half years into the four years. So what, what are some of the lessons and what's coming up? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the year where you declare your major, right? Which is <laughs> to say what, year, what direction you're going in. And, um, and in some ways, we're three years into the journey, and in some ways, we're only maybe one year into the journey, because um, remote and hybrid are super different, and um, remote work and pandemic work are really different. And so, you know, the experience of working remotely with a team during lockdown, where you're not leaving the house, your kids are underfoot, you're trying to work out of a closet or your dining room, you know, full time, is really different from the experience of being able to work part time in the office and part time at home. And you know, most organizations are only a year maybe into that model. Um, so I think the what we're seeing now is, I mean, it's you know, I, I keep waiting for organizations to say like, okay, we got it, we figured it out. And there are certainly plenty of organizations, and frankly, in particular, I think plenty of C-level executives. I think a lot of folks at the top are very eager to declare themselves done. They're really tired of having to renegotiate the way that they work. Um, but um, employees are, for the most part, not cooperating, really. Uh, I don't see too many organizations where they have found a stable equilibrium in terms of um, Management is happy with the amount people are coming into the office. Employees are happy with the amount they're coming into the office. Uh, most organizations are still in a state of contestation. And so, um, you know, I think where we're at now in terms of, of the shift to hybrid is for organizations actually to step back and think about not how do we get back to 2019, because 2019 is gone, um, but instead to think about you know, what kind of organization do we want to become? What kind of employer do we want to become? What kind of, in many cases, business do we want to be? And those are questions that are much bigger than how many days a week are we going to expect our people to come into the office? And particularly um, with the explosion of AI and the shifts in the structure of work and in the um, labor market, this is a moment for organizations to rebuild themselves, not just around the way they combine office time and remote time, but around how they combine human labor with AI labor. Hmm, right. And the answer to the question of what kind of organization do we want to be would vary depending on the organization. But what are some frameworks to keep in mind when a company is asking that question? Yeah. A lot of this comes down to organizational culture, right? People talk a lot about culture. And um, and, and people use culture often without a lot of clarity about what they mean. And so, you know, one of my stories, in the, favorite personal stories in this respect, is a number of years ago when I was looking at joining an organization, I was concerned personally about culture fit with, with the organization. And I said that to the CEO. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. We're great on culture fit. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's, that's how... You know, a fair number of executives will talk about culture. We want to have 
great culture, as if, you know, great culture is like great ice cream. I mean, even great ice cream is up for debate. What is great ice cream? But, you know, different cultures are going to suit different kinds of businesses and different kinds of employees. And an organization that tries to have great culture is, is almost destined to fail because you can't be the right employer for everyone. And so, um, you know, I think at the most fundamental, a, a, a pretty common divide is between the um, sort of work hard, play hard cultures and the holistic um, organizations that really try and maintain um, more of an even balance of, of work and personal time for their employees, right? So there are the places that drive folks. They want to see you working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. You're expected to like leave it all on the field and you know it's it's very high pressure. There are organizations that are more like touchy-feely. We talk to our employees a lot about their well-being. We provide lots of resources for people's mental health. And, you know, we're concerned if we see you answering your email routinely on the weekend. Um, those are kind of polar opposites on one dimension. Um, and then, of course, there's also the degree to which an organization works digitally, um, how much of our work do we do online, whether we're at the office or at home, versus how much do we focus on face-to-face -face interaction as an organization? I would say this in terms of, you know, what's the right mix of, of um, office time and remote time? It is definitely not one answer for every organization. And it's not even the one answer for every team within an organization. Um, because, you know... Look, office and remote time are not just, it's not a matter of just, you know, what's convenient or do I feel like putting on pants today, right? They're good for different things. Office time is fabulous for real-time face-to-face collaboration. It's way better for meetings than Zoom. Um, so if you have the good fortune of working with people who live in the same basic geographic area as yourself, then why not try and have those meetings face-to-face -face on the days you're in the office? But office time is very annoying if you're trying to do you know, a deep dive on financial analysis, if you're trying to write something long form, if you're um, trying to do a significant um, st strategic rethink. It's very hard to do deep focused work in an office. And you know, one of the things I'll often say is like, the, the meeting focus culture we have makes sense or made sense in a world where people came into the office every day because you might as well be in meetings all day when you're at the office because if you try and get any work done on your own, you're going to get interrupted every 10 minutes anyhow. So ideally what we're looking at is people do their solitary, deep focused work on their remote days and probably get a heck of a lot more done on those days than they would if they tried to do that work in the office. They do their more collaborative work on their days in the office so they don't have all these Zoom interruptions and video meetings on their days at home. But what that balance is depends on your role. I mean, some people have work that is almost entirely collaborative, in which case then ideally they're working with people in the same geographic area and they're in the office meeting in person. Other people have work that is mostly solitary. And in that case, you know, minimize the time they're spending at the office because they're, they're going to get way more done by being outside the office where, if, if that's where they focus better. So to try and find an answer, I think, overlooks, first of all, the differences between roles and the balance of interdependent and, and solitary work. But also, and this is like a, you know, very personal issue, I guess, for me, is I think it really overlooks the divergence in how people think. And you know, I've been doing some research on this recently because I was speaking with an audience a couple months ago of you know, pretty senior executives, really high, kind of an interesting group, and um, was talking about you know, really thinking carefully about the right balance of home and remote. And one of the executives in the room said to me, look, I get it. I get why employees want to be able to keep working remotely some of the time. But, you know, I, I've been you know, working for a long time. And when I see what happens in an office, I just know there's like nothing like face to face interaction. Face to face interaction is just this incredibly powerful way of working together, and nothing can replace it. And we really need as much of that as possible. And I looked around the room, and this was all C level leaders who were all responsible for PLs of 500 million or more. So, pretty hardcore group. 
And I said, like, look, you know, everybody in this room is where you are in your career because you're really good at face-to-face -face interaction. And, and we see this in the research on CEO personalities. Like, CEOs are not like everybody else, and they are much better at interpersonal interaction. But, you know, the week that I had that um, conversation happened to be the week that GPT four came out, this new model that was just mind blowing in terms of what it was able to achieve. And you know, I said to this guy, okay, I get that you're really into face-to-face -face interaction and that's where your magic happens, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that the engineers who just transformed the world with GPT-4 might not have that same skill set, right? And so to assume that everybody in your organization is gonna be giving their best when they're face to face assumes that that is everybody's sweet spot. And the truth is like there are different personality types. They're, you know, in a world of neurodiversity we, that we now understand, we recognize that some people are actually more successful, at least in certain kinds of tasks, when they are solitary, when they're not having to interact in real time or face to face. And what we're what we're seeing, I think, to some extent in the push to return to the office is the bias of the management class, which by definition is people who are fabulous at face-to-face. -face. Right. So you've been on the media recently, and even in what you said here, there's clearly a strife bubbling up uh, between those who would want the employees back in and the employees, yeah. some of whom don't want that. Uh, it, it's manifesting even in negotiations for contracts, for unions, yeah. for the war on talent. So left unchecked, if we don't find that equilibrium, well, what are the consequences? I think in the fullness of time, and it will depend a little bit on the sector and the, and the region where an organization is based, but I actually think that um, in the fullness of time, organizations that force people back to the office more than the employees are ready for, more than the employees need in order to be effective, are going to suffer um, a pretty significant competitive disadvantage or, because you're gonna have to pay a premium in the labor market to get folks to the office when survey after survey shows that most people who've been working remotely want to keep working remotely at least three days a week. So, you know, look, if you are in a business that can succeed on the strength of B, B minus talent, then to heck with that preference do what you want and bring in your human widgets. And if the widget doesn't want to be there, get a different widget. Um, but, uh, you know, most organizations need at least some A, A plus talent. And you're competing for that talent with other organizations. And it's very, you know, consistent in, in study after study that if you don't provide people flexibility in the form of, of some opportunity to work remotely, you're going to have to pay more for that talent. So there is a high competitive price to pay if you insist on bringing people back to the office when you need to hire people who might not want to be there. And I also think that, you know, coming back to this question of culture, you know, we're already seeing a pretty high price within organizations um, that don't manage the hybrid transition effectively because most organizations have at least a portion of the workforce that was not able to work remotely during COVID, right? If you are a factory worker, if you're a waiter, if you're a healthcare professional, you were on site all the way through COVID. And these folks do not feel super delighted to hear their colleagues complaining about having to be in the office two days a week. So this is already creating a lot of internal division within organizations that managers are going to have to bridge. And you're not going to navigate that tr transition successfully by just dragging people in by the hair and telling them, like, here you are back in the office, suck it up, buttercup, right? Like, that's not a recipe for a thriving organizational culture. And I find it so ironic that that culture is what people use to justify it. It's like, we need this for our culture. Oh, you need really annoyed employees? That's good for your culture? You want to have your on-site employees have to listen to the whining of their, you know, hybrid colleagues all the time? That's good for your culture? Like, this is why this is why I said it's a four-year process. Like you're not going to manage this transition by edict and have a successful outcome. You have to um, manage it in conversation with your employees and also 
um, while thinking in a, in a pretty expansive way about how you expect your labor force to evolve in a world where you know, some of these, these tasks are, are gonna move to an AI model instead. The, the most of the companies and specifically the leaders you talked to at the companies, do they have that expansive outlook? Uh, it's, funny. it's funny. I just I just got a question like this yesterday from somebody who said, you know, because uh, I talk about um, the importance of moving away from from ma managing people by hours if you're going to really make the most of AI because you want people to feel invested in accomplishing as much as they can with these tools. And if they're worried about protecting their hours, they're not gonna wanna use the AI because it's gonna cut into their hours. Um, and so, and of course also managing by outcomes rather than hours is pretty crucial if you don't have people sitting in front of you because you need to trust them to get their work done and see that they're delivering their work rather than that they're at their desk. And uh, one of the folks in the room said, well, you know, we've talked about OKRs and KPIs for years, like that's already how um, how we're managing. And <laughs> I, you know, I asked him, like, well, is that what I would see if I looked at your IT department, or are you surveilling your employees' keystrokes, right? Because lots of organizations talk the talk about we're managing for outcomes, we're managing for employee well-being, we're managing for culture, but that does not align with the extraordinarily high rates of surveillance that are now routine for remote employees, the vast majority of whom are being uh, monitored for hours at the desk, keystrokes, you know, are they staying at their computers? If you really want your employees to be responsible for what they're delivering, then um, you're not surveilling them. Right. So the takeaway is coercion doesn't work. Coercion works in the short run, and coercion may work in the long run if you are looking at a workforce that can be significantly replaced by AI, because you know eventually there may be enough slack in the labor market, enough excess talent looking for work that you are able to um, sort of set the terms of employment in that way. But I think in the medium term, um, well, two things. First of all, the big wins in the AI era are not gonna come from people who just replace 2023 talent with AIs. It's gonna come from people who are using AI to deliver you know, services and products um, and to work in ways that we can't even foresee yet. We're starting to see them, but you know, those, are, those are the big wins. And that's, that's not gonna happen if your employees see AI as a threat, which is what they're gonna do if you have this course of model. And then, you know, in the, in the medium term, um, if you are trying to energize and motivate your organization, if you're trying to drive innovation in your organization, you need your employees to actually buy in and care about what you're doing. And coercion does not make that happen. Hmm. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that AI, um, uh -huh. generative AI, you mentioned chat GBT4. Uh, most people are familiar with three. So just very quickly and simply, how are those technologies going to A, uh, integrate themselves into what we already do, and B, uh, as you said, do things we don't even foresee we'll need to do. So the first thing first, how's it gonna change how we're already doing stuff? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the things that I find, I mean, I, I, I think it's just serendipitous, but um, in a funny way, hybrid really set the stage for the arrival of AI in a lot of ways because it created the, it created pain points that AI is ideally positioned to solve. And it also um, removed some of the benefits of work that AI would not be able to replicate. So pain points. I mean, <laughs> I think I, I remember you'll remember, right? I used to give a lot of talks about digital overload, and I think about 
<laughs> I wish I could travel back to, you know, 2014, 2015 when I was talking to people about digital overload and say, like, boy, you know, buckle up, because if you think you're suffering from digital overload mm -hmm. now, just wait and see what we have in store. Because the volume of email and Slack and messages and meetings, it gets just bananas. And AI does a fantastic job of um, reducing and kind of triaging um, all of those different kinds of communications, right? You can use AI to summarize meetings, um, which I actually think is, is terrific. This idea that you have to pay full attention all the way through meetings is a terrible use of resources when often it's only five minutes of a meeting that's actually relevant to any given person in the room. So by all means, like let the AI keep track. And then when somebody says, you know, Charles, what's your perspective? You can look and figure out where you're at in the conversation or maybe not even go to the meeting because you can get the synthesis later via AI. AI can help digest the long email and write the reply. And I don't think we're very far away from a moment, and this is you know, problematic in a lot of ways, where you're gonna have employees, quote unquote, communicating back and forth, and it's just entirely one AI talking to the other AI. But hey, if it's a matter of reconciling your calendars, or I need a file, you have a file, that's great if the AI handles all that. So some of the digital overload um, pain, I think, of hybrid is gonna get very, helpfully addressed by AI. And then I think the, the flip side of how it prepares us for AI is that, you know, if you're mostly interact, I have lots of colleagues who I have never met in person, people I've worked with incredibly closely. And at a certain point, if I'm not interacting with you in person, and if the majority or even the entirety of our interaction is via Slack, why, why do I care that you're a person? Like, do I, or is it fine if you're an AI? I mean, in a workplace where so much of our interaction is entirely text-based or entirely virtual, the cost of replacing people with AI on an interpersonal level is much lower. We're not missing the touchy-feely because there's no touchy-feely to begin with. So that's a little creepy, but I don't think it helps to avoid um, the truth of the of the circumstances we've already created, which is we already have taken a lot of the human interaction out of work by going remote, which is not terrible as long as we have strategies for integrating our kind of cultural values, our organizational values and priorities into our digital communications. And we have set up work in a way that gives our employees enough latitude to get their human interaction elsewhere. You know, it, it's, it's not good for us as humans and it's not good for your employees if they never talk to other people, but maybe those other people don't have to be their colleagues. Maybe those other people can be friends, family, people in other industries who they learn from and bring ideas back to the organization after a long walk in the middle of the day. Um, all of those, those functions of human interaction can be fulfilled outside the workplace if we are spending less than 12 hours a day at our desks. Right, and uh, you know, beyond automatically unsubscribing from emails that you never signed up for, uh, doing Calendly type stuff, what are the measures to put into place where we don't have the AIs encroaching on stuff we actually do want humans to do? So, you know, speaking really personally, and, and you know, part of it is it's really important, I think, to differentiate between all the ways the AIs have shortfalls right now and what we think might be true in six months or a year or two years. Because the trajectory, even over the past six months, is you know, shocking. Like the difference between using um, AI tools that were available a year ago and using AI tools that are available now is, is you know, extraordinary. And... But there still are right now lots of, uh, lots of things that AI can't do. And it often surprises me what it can't do. Like some of the things I give it that I'm like, for sure it's going to be able to um, crack and, and it can't. Uh, tone remains really elusive. So I'm a writer. And, you know, candidly, I think what GPT will spit out on the strength of a prompt and an outline um, is better than probably 95% of the content that's on the internet, but I would like to believe that I'm in the other 5%. And I mean, I'm a professional writer. Like that's, the, you know, the reason I get hired to write things is I have a distinctive voice and a distinctive viewpoint. And I will feed like long samples of my past work to GPT and ask it to um, try and write in my voice. And it, it still can't quite do it, although it does an amazing job. I think the like for me, the big wins, it's really... 
I mean, so I'm about as nerdy techie as you can get without being a programmer. I've built websites for a living and I've done little bits of scripting here and there. And I have done a disturbingly large number of weird things by connecting Google Sheets to other things. But I've never written a computer program until a month ago. And um, I've written several Chrome extensions now. I've written an extension for this productivity app I use all the time. I've written a freestanding uh, program to build a dynamic database of all the Broadway shows I've ever seen. Um, and it's, you know, that ability to get GPT to not exactly do for you the things you can't do, but to help you cross over to a next level in terms of your skill set that I think is really exciting. And, you know, w with a lot of experimentation, um, what, what I've found is as a successful strategy is not to say, give me this code. It can, it can do that in some circumstances, but rather to say, you are, you are a programming teacher or you are a statistics professor and you are helping a student learn to do X thing and you have two goals. One is to make the thing with them and the other is to help them understand how to make the thing. And so what you end up with then is the ability to deliver a new kind of product as, a, as an individual that it might have been beyond your capacity, you can deliver a piece of software, you can deliver a level of data analysis you might not have been capable of. And in the process of delivering that, you're actually learning how to do it because GPT is self-documenting. And you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that individualized tutoring, individualized teaching is dramatically more effective than group teaching, but not scalable, right? Like we can barely keep our classrooms to 40 kids, we're not going to be providing an individual teacher to every kid. But now we can provide an individual teacher to every professional to learn their next set of skills by having them work with an AI to do something that's just a little further past what they thought they could do and by teaching them how to do it as, as they're actually undertaking the project. And that I think is hugely exciting in terms of what you what it means for you know developing your workforce and um, expanding what you're capable of with a given group of employees. So one way to view it is as a kind of potential accelerator. Oh yeah, well no potential. I mean it is an accelerator. I mean look there's two things you could do. You can either dramatically slash your workforce and replace a whole bunch of them with AIs depending on the kind of work you do. Um, or you can take the workforce you have and have a massive multiplier effect in terms of what they're capable of. And you know, I think in probably most organizations, we're gonna see a little bit of both. We're gonna see a thinning of some parts of the workforce um, and, and then an expansion in the potential of other parts. And of course, for individual employees and for team leaders, what really matters is how do we approach AI so that we are part of the accelerator side rather than the thinning. Right, right. Ex potential coercion. Yeah. And this is why like, it makes me nuts when I hear about organizations banning GPT. I mean, on the one hand, I, I'm, sympathetic to, I'm sympathetic to the security concerns. I'm sympathetic to the we're all about to um, destroy the world concerns, but I'm... Those are big concerns. <laughs> Those are not unimportant. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, my problem is I'm, I'm such a fatalist. So um, I just think like the cat is out of the bag and there's nothing we can really do to stop it. And so if we assume there is going to be AI, um, all you do by banning it in your organization is put yourself behind um, from a competitive point of view and prevent your employees from learning how to be empowered users. It basically, you're, you're only giving them the replacement option. You're not giving them the option of learning how to accelerate and amplify what they're capable of. Okay. So, so far we talked about the things, the accelerating what we do, perhaps it's an impossible question to answer, but what about that next step of the, doing the thing we could not even envision it would help us to do? Like what, what do you see in that? spectrum of the future? So, you know, I'm, I'm a social scientist by training. And when I look around at the 
challenges we face within organizations and then as a species, you know, maybe science will save us, but um, how long it will take for science to save us is imponderable. We could save ourselves, right? Like at the end of the day, it would be super hard for humans to make the adaptations we need in order to avert climate change. It would be super hard for humans to make the social policies we need to absorb potentially massive reductions in employment levels due to AI um, without having that be a, a total social catastrophe, but we could do it. These are, these are choices we could make as, as societies. And we, and we don't because um, in, a, in a market economy and a fragmented world where different governments have different incentives, um, we just can't achieve the coordination to avert climate change or ad address these questions of income inequality. So that sounds really hopeless. The thing that makes me not totally despair, and, and this long predated GPT, is the possibility that <laughs> we will somehow accidentally, serendipitously develop AI that is better than we are. <laughs> and Because if, if we do, if the AI actually wanted to help us avert disaster, the good news is we've given it all the tools it needs. Like we've clearly created a media ecosystem that is capable of massively manipulating our political and consumer choices. If Vladimir Putin, with an army of probably not particularly sophisticated hackers in warehouses in various parts of Russia, can help shape the outcome of elections in Western democracies, it is not gonna be very hard for a superpowered AI to get us to stop driving our cars everywhere. And so my when it, when it comes to like dramatic big picture dreams for AI, my dramatic big picture dream for AI is that the AI takes over from marketers whose goal is to make us buy more stuff and instead uses all the te techniques of marketing to make us not kill ourselves. Um, I don't know how hopeful that scenario is, but I honestly feel like it's no less likely than humans saving themselves. Okay. That's good. Good answer. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Charles.